the name of the one and only, the most merciful dispenser of grace. Whispers of the desert night wind. Beyond the bloodshed and bombing, beyond the rubble and ruins of homes and habits, hidden identities rise from beneath the weight of authoritarian secularism. Life is measured in mere statistical body count, bid as a zero-sum game, and traded at discount in the Shia Sunni marketplace, where the oblivion of the dead meets the deadline. Social harmony rises in jagged inequality against the background of the shifting sands of an uncivil war that turns into a foe, any friend whose otherness is cast by faith. Where body-clad souls are dumped in the heap of humanity, the land claims those who once claimed it, the neighborhood gangs spray paint serious tomorrow in shades of dark ideologies, non-Syrian, non-Islamic, non-human. In the nowhereness of the refugee camps that dot the desert in ineligible scripted code, children see life through the sectarian lens of a fractured reality. There, Syria's otherness stands naked to the stares of strangers. Its story yearns for a listening ear to tell itself even if in discorded stances and speak of the dreaded dark clouds that heralded the season of change. Serious stories whispered on the wings of the night wind that blows across the desert. Its sufferings have been etched onto a nation's scarred psyche, one painful needle point at a time. Behind the shattered window panes of an ancient temple of an ancient god, a shattered heart traces its final thumping. The menorah call echoes his greatness as the unfulfilled heart's moments count down to its final love dub, love dub. That could have been the end of the life of any one of us but it has become the end of life for so many innocent across the Muslim world. The poem simply described what happens in Syria, but it could be any country. It could be most of the countries labeled as Muslim societies. The tragedy is much too great to talk about. But what's evident is that it has come to the surface as part of a deeply rooted misery that we sometimes deny and sometimes accept, but often ignore. It recalls the story of a Yazidi Christian couple when they were running for their life and came across a checkpoint where an ISIS warrior stopped them, asked them for their identity, and inquired if they were Muslim. The man nodded in the affirmative, and the warrior said, if you are Muslim, recite a verse of the Quran. The man recited, and the warrior nodded 
Go ahead, you're okay. In a short distance, his wife freaked out, scared, and saying, how dare, we are not Muslims. You recited the Bible in Arabic. We could have been killed. The man said, you need not worry. Had he read the Quran, he would not be doing what he's doing. This might come across as a, as a joke or as a story as a, in, in a sense of humor, but what lies beneath the humor is the campaign by ISIS and other such organizations of forced conversion and slaughter to turn the whole world into a belief system that only they think is right. And they do this by invoking scripture to validate and justify their mission. And here is the scripture. I would like to invite you to guess the chapter and verse. When you march up to attack a city, make its people an offer of peace. If they accept and open their gates, all the people in it shall be subject to forced labor and shall work for you. If they refuse to make peace and they engage you in battle, lay siege to that city. When the Lord your God delivers it into your hand, put to the sword all the men in it. As for the women, the children, the livestock, and everything else in the city, you may take these as plunder for yourselves. Anybody wants to guess the chapter and verse? The Quran? No, it's not an Old Testament book, I don't know. It's an Old Good enough. The Bible, Deuteronomy, chapter 20, going to war. If you look at the action of the people on the ground, and the way they claim it, that this is, quote-unquote, an Islamic activity, a jihad, it matches exactly what the Bible recommends. What I didn't read to you was that the Bible is so specific that it even gives the names of the tribes to be attacked. The Hittites, the Amorites, Canaanites, Priscillites, Hivites, and Jacobites, if I'm pronouncing all these historical names. In other words, God gives a recipe for the destruction and slaughter and total annihilation of towns and villages. What would Quran say in, uh, on, a, on a similar topic? If a human kills another human, not in a retaliation of murder, it would be as if he killed all humankind. And if anyone saved a life, it would be as if he saved the life of all humanity. That's the Quran. So we have two scriptures coming pretty much from the same part of the world. When we look at the deeds and the actions, compare that with the words that they invoke, there's a drastic difference. If we suggest that, yes, it is a problem, it's bad, it's terrible, but it's only the extremists if it were only the extremists, that would be good news. Because we can make the assumption that then the rest of the society is okay. It's okay to have a few rotten apples in a barrel. But what I'm going to share with you is that perhaps it's not just a few rotten apples, but the whole barrel is rotten with few exceptions.
there is a superficiality of an outer layer of a Muslim society in the social and political identity and an inherent decadence that describes the action of the few in total contradiction to the edicts of the belief system they claim. The trend in general is as follows, that Muslims or those who identify themselves as Muslim, and we will just consider that like the equivalent of a license plate, not what runs the car, not the engine, not what moves us, but what we claim to be moved by. The license plate says Muslim and Islamic, but that which drives us are evil forces that we have not been able to control, that our universe, I'm talking about the Muslim universe, which is a God-centered universe, had become a self-centered universe, and the self has taken over the God in us, and therefore our action in our subservient modality to our self, the soul, the nafs, has become another God within us, which is nothing but a propensity in the negative. You may call it shaitan, the devil, it doesn't matter how you label it. So long as you can sense the negativity of it, and how that negativity affects the human family in general. And so, in general, we have taken up most or many of the bad characteristics and habits of other traditions, religious or otherwise. That's bad enough. But we have also given up all the good characteristics that we were supposed to have as Muslims. Let me repeat, we have adopted the bad characteristics of others and we have abandoned the good characteristics of ourselves. So in short, you have gotten the worst of both worlds. If we had landed as Martians in some Muslim society, and want to describe that society by the characteristics they have. It would be that they have become compulsively religious through every trait. And when I mean compulsively, that is the religiosity of rites and ritual, which is not the same as the religiosity of the love of God. There is a difference that they are obsessively ritualistic and have traded the essence of their religious creed and spirituality for the mere form of an organized religion that is against modernity, civility, progress, education, civil rights, and I can go on. In this obsession, Muslims have become misogynistic, anti-women, in every respect and have resorted to draconian laws of women's suppression against which the Prophet campaigned all his life. Islam came as a cohesive, inclusive, freedom-loving faith system to restore dignity to humankind. It despised some of the practices of the early Jews and Christians in particular, those that stood in the way of human intellectual development. When, for example, they suppressed women, destroyed artistic expression, burned books, burned humans at stake uh, because they believe otherwise. The Prophet considered these abhorrent acts against human nature. Yet, followers of the same Prophet resort to the same practices that he fought for, against. Case in point, 
stoning. Stoning someone to death was a common practice among the Hebrews, and the Old Testament makes numerous references to it. In case anyone questions it, I'll give you the numbers. The first one is Numbers 14, 10, 1 Samuel 36, John 10, 33, Acts 7, 54, Acts 7, 59, and Hebrews 11, 37. This is the Old Testament. We are talking about stoning. And some of the descriptives are beyond belief. Now, by contrast, the Quran considers stoning a cruel punishment. And the only mention, uh, the only does not mean one time. The few times that it has mentioned is only in reference to what had been done in the past. Therefore, while the Old and the New Testament talk about stoning as a practice, the Quran does not prescribe it as punishment. This is the reality of the scriptural theoretical level. This is what the Bible says and that's what the Quran says. But out there, in the so-called Muslim world, the Jews and the Christian, whose scriptures either mentions it or recommends it, they have abandoned this cruel act. Where Muslims whose book has prohibited it are practicing it. Apostasy. The Quran accepted as a norm, as a right of an individual endowed by God with free will, not just to believe as he or she may wish, but to change their faith as many times as they want to. That's what the human free will amounts to. And to make a point of it, the Quran is specifically repeating that uh, hypothetical case, the Surah An Nisa, um, by 137. And, and uh, pay attention to the repetition. Inna ladina amanu, thumma kafaru, thumma amanu, thumma kafaru, thumma zdadu kufran lam yakun allahu liyaghfir lahum wa la liyahdihim sabila. Behold, as for those who come to believe and then deny the truth, and again come to believe and again deny the truth, and thereafter grow stubborn in their denial of the truth, God will not forgive them, nor will he guide them in any way. The simple logical conclusion we can draw from this is that if turning away from Islam was punishable by death, then a person would have been punished, and as it is done today, killed, and therefore there was no need for that person to come back and forth and, and become a Muslim and non-Muslim several times over and over again. But the Quran says, no, they can. They had to have been allowed to live in order to deny the faith. Then they would have been allowed to live to come back to Islam and go back and come back. In other words, that is not a cause for taking someone's life because either they sincerely doubt what they believe or they may have altered uh, motives, which is all with God, not with you, not with me. Well, in, in Christian Europe, um, at the time of the Inquisition, uh, they were hard at work to force convert non-Christians. And the practices of inquisition, apostasy, and prohibitive uh, theocratic suppression and the burning of people of non-Christian faith and all that, that was their lot. Christian Europe did it. Muslims didn't do it. Now, a thousand years later, Europe has abandoned the practice. Muslims have adopted it. Now, we kill them at stake. We burn them at stake and we kill them. So today's Christian majority states abhor such practices and Muslim majority states follow it.
according to uh, statistics in, in 2011, some 20 countries in the world, uh, they would punish apostasy by death. All of the Muslim majority countries. And the few that didn't, we're talking about in the context of their constitution and their legal system. And the few that didn't, they are, they are lenient to impose fines, jails, impose additional penalties, uh, including those of uh, denying them their children's custody, marriage annulment, and so on and so forth. They have done nothing other than what God had given them the power to choose out of their own free will. Because if that were not so, then the Quran would be contradicting itself. Chapter 2, 256. There shall be no compulsion in matters of faith. That's what God says. But the rebellious God within many of us over in the Muslim world says otherwise. Says, I dare you disclaim Islam. You recant Islam. That will be your last moment to live. And then you would think that the Sharia laws in these countries that are supposedly rooted in the Quran would be adhering to these principles. Not so. You would think that the Grand Muftis and the scholars in these Muslim societies obey and give clear commands that the Quran prohibits it. Not so. And you would think that their legislatures would have read the Quran, uh, again, chapter 2, verse 62, that extends God's mercy to those who share the universality of Tawheed the oneness of being, regardless of faith, tradition. Not so. So if the legislator doesn't pay attention, the scholars don't pay attention, the legal system doesn't pay attention, do you really call all these violations by the whole apparatus of a government and still put the label of Islamic on it when they are contradicting relevant verses of the Quran. Uh, these are uh, clear examples of how certain Muslims would basically infringe upon divine authority. Let me clear that. They infringe upon divine authority and they give themselves the right to make the unlawful lawful and vice versa. A right that God did not even give his prophet. I think in Surah Tahrim we have Ya Ayyuhan Nabi, Lemma to Harimo Ma Ahala Law Laka, Taptari Maradote as Wajika, Wallahu Gafur Rahim. The context uh, might not be relevant for our discussion, but clearly it says that, O oh Prophet, why dost thou, out of a desire to please, a prohibition of something that God has made lawful unto thee? In other words, God Almighty says to his prophet Muhammad وسلم, that you do not have the authority to make the lawful and lawful and vice versa. But today's Muslims do take matters into their own hands uh, and the clear injunction of the Quran that notwithstanding they manipulate according to their wishes. In the general context of governance, there are uh, certain models in Islamic history that if they were not scholars to understand things in the complexity of jurisprudential law and this and that and the other, fine, at least they could have studied the history and used the Islamic history as a model. The early caliphate period, that um, the, the main four concepts are the wilaya, the Karama, the Mithaq, and the Khilafah, which gives dignity to the citizens in the context of a compact between the ruler and the ruled. In other words, there is a reciprocity 
of respect and adherence to the laws by both parties. So when the ruler is wrong, he or she is as punishable by the law as the subject of that state would be. Not necessarily in our times. And these are not just um, matters that we could uh, speculate and talk and uh, throw words around and, and tell stories. But uh, there is a, a research done that I would like to share with you uh, by um, Sherzad Rahman and Hussein Askari. Uh, the title is very similar to the title of the talk today, How Islamic Are Islamic Countries? This is published in the Global Economy Journal. And uh, this is a very, very authentic research. This is not what the Western media or the Western government says, or quote-unquote the enemies of Islam are describing. This is a thorough research of 208 countries around the world. 208 countries. So they have not left any country outside of their research. The criteria for research is a very, very extensive index that is pages and pages long. But they come under the umbrella of four um, indices. Uh, and these indices are called the Islamicity Index. That how much the concept of Islam as recommended by God Almighty in the Quran, as exemplified by the life of the Prophet, through the clear recommendation. How many or, you know, how much, what percentage of the society really adheres to these? And the indices are as follows. The economic Islamicity. The legal and governance Islamicity the human and political rights Islamicity, the international relations Islamicity. So in the economics, uh, it's not just as simple as whether they allow riba or not, whether the bank takes interest or not. But in terms of how does the society compare, in terms of using an index where the haves and the have-nots are treated fairly, and when people, where people are given right economic opportunities according to what the Quran suggests. Okay, not, not a speculative thing. So it's all based on if the Quranic principles were translated into an economic system for the 21st century, and then you wanted to test this model, the Quranic principles of economics, how would people adhere to that? The same thing goes for the legal and the governance. How does the legal system work? Is it corrupt? Is there gender inequality? Is there gender bias? Are the sentences issued fairly? What percentage of the people are in jails? Are these based on certain ethnic makeup or certain people are targeted differently and so on and so forth? The human rights, the political rights, Again, once we use the words in the English language, we automatically assume it's something that comes from the West. And we say, oh, that has nothing to do with us. Human rights, that's for the Europeans and the Americans. Human rights are human rights. You deny it, you deny yourself a place in that context. The international relations. Again, how do you deal with, with your neighboring regional and global partners in business, in diplomacy, and so on. Uh, anyways, the, the thing is very, very extensive, the, the research. And I recommend it to everyone to read this. The point is that if you can affect the life of another human being, there is no greater ibadah than that. Yes, recite the Quran, that's wonderful. That's good only for you. But if you are centered only on yourness, on your ego, on yourself, and you have denied that you're part of the totality of 
the human family, you're not acting responsibly as a Muslim. Let me read you the final result of the research um, that, that I refer to, and I will mention the Islamic countries in ranks, okay, which is the most Islamic country. Now, Islamic by their acts, by their deeds, by what they do for their citizen, by how they avoid corruption and mistreatment of minorities, gender or otherwise. The number one Muslim country, not claimed Islam, number one Muslim country in the world is New Zealand. Number two, Luxembourg, Ireland, Iceland, Finland. When you go through this whole list, um, you don't find any Islamic countries in the, in the top ten, none. In the top 20, none. Up to number 30, not a single Muslim country has made it. The first Muslim country that comes close is Malaysia, number 38. And then the next one is number 48, which is Kuwait. But these countries are not claiming Islamic values, or Quranic values for that matter, or social justice, or political fairness, or human rights. They just call their country New Zealand, that's it. What do we call our countries? The Islamic Republic of this and the Islamic Republic of that, and everywhere you go the word Islamic is sprinkled merely for deception because these politicians, these rulers can manipulate any policy and in the name of Islam they can implement it because nobody would raise an eyebrow if it's called Islamic. And where do you find most of the Islamic countries? How many countries were there? 208. Next to the last is Islamic. Number 20, 206, Somalia. 202, Sudan. 198, Yemen. 197, Chad. 196, Libya, and then goes on, Mauritania, Djibouti, Guinea-Bissau, Niger, and so on and so forth. So, who is Islamic? For Muslim, the prerequisite of your faith is your adherence to the principle and acting upon that principle. Amal, action, counts, it matters. And our political systems are totally void of that. When I mean totally, just look at the statistics. And like I said, this was not something superficial. These two scholars, they are Muslim. Okay? But uh, fortunately they live on this side of the divide, so they are not put in jail or anything. Uh, you could imagine what, what would have happened to them if they had done such research in one of the quote-unquote Islamic countries. So the looking by this index, then it takes um, the every doubt out of the fact that the Muslim world is in misery, deep-rooted misery. Everything is in the core of our society. We cannot be dismissive anymore that, oh, this is Western propaganda, oh, this is the Western media, or it's the Western imperialist designs. Yes, all of those are there, they have their own role to play. But they could not have played it if we were not so corrupt and corrupt to the core. Uh, let me give you one more example. Have you heard the word takfir? What is takfir? It's to claim another as non-Muslim. And the simple logic of it is 
If someone came to you and said, how do you know? An individual's faith is in one's heart. No one has access to that heart except God Almighty. So since when did you become God to know what is in the person's heart? So what do we do? We do character assassination, either of our opponents or of people whose behavior, action, their looks, their name, we don't like. You know who else practiced this? Christian Europe. They didn't say takfir, they said excommunication. And anyone who criticized the edicts of the church or the founding fathers that had become an institution were simply excommunicated, defrogged, and there are many other terms for it. Do they do that now? No. Do we do it? Yes. So we adopted their ways. So, on the one hand, we are saying we are going to do a dawah. That's supposed to be good, right? Well, the dawah that it's done today is a Christian practice. Televangelist, technovangelist, and a whole lot of other varieties of it. They convert people. Muslims should not convert people because the Quran says there is no compulsion. Muslims are supposed to do dawa, which means to invite. But our dawa is more as a coercion, which becomes more like what the Christians do. Look at the whole continent of Africa. Almost every country along the equator is divided into a Muslim North and a Christian South. And they both do exactly the same thing. Forget what you believe, believe how I tell you. And it depends on what you speak. So you get North Sudan, South Sudan, Northern Nigeria, Southern Nigeria. And these people are slaughtering each other. I'm sure you've heard of the Central African Republic tragedies. That one day they attack the Muslims, then the next day or the next week they attack the Christians. They take time. It's uh, fun for them. And what do the rest of the world do? Nothing. We have missionary, Christian missionaries, that that tell, uh, that that sent thousands and millions. Uh, I, I can't give you a mathematical number, but a lot of money to support their effort. And then we have. Muslim missionaries, I wouldn't call that a dawah, because they are doing a competition for saving the soul of those poor Africans. Because if we weren't there, how would they be? Doesn't matter what our scripture says. So, in the context that we are trying to spread Islam, um, we are in reality making more non-Muslim then we are making Muslims, regardless of how we, we approach the issue. Now, the reason we are making more non-Muslims is that on the, other, on the one hand we go to the Christians and Jews and uh, whoever else is to invite them into Islam, but before five or ten have come into the fold of Islam, we go over to this side and we issue the fatwa of takfir over this and that and the other. All of a sudden, all the Shi'is are kafir and all the Sunnis are or the Wahhabis or whatever. So we are making a lot more kafirs than we are making Muslims. What happened to our mathematical equation? And where does this happen? In the most vulnerable of the Muslim societies, the most economically vulnerable in refugee camps is where this campaign goes on. You see Wahhabi quote-unquote missionaries that go to Afghanistan and then tell poor people, okay, now you have to become Muslim. And the guy says, wait a minute. I've been Muslim for more than a thousand years. What are you talking about? 
Or forget what you had learned. You have to become Muslim again. Born again. And so they are making the Muslims over and over and over until it satisfies the ego of this individual who thinks he has the monopoly over one's faith. Now, then does it surprise anyone that when we see on TV the refugees flocking to Europe, this happened some 14 or at least 1300 years ago. Muslims were growing, going to Europe. The Europeans were in the Dark Ages. And Muslims said, look, we have a message that there is one God for all humanity. Not my God, not your God, one universal God. Let's all become brothers and sisters. Muslims went to Europe to take science, to take technology, their new inventions and all that. And the Europeans didn't know, how did you get this? Well, the Muslims say, we have created a civilization of inclusivity. Muslims, Christians, Jews, Hindus, Rostrians, they all can come. Indians, Chinese, Persians, Central Asians, Arabs, they all can come and we share. We have a conference, an annual conference, where we exchange ideas. We call it Hajj, where we share with each other the things we have invented, the things we have created, the technologies we have, uh, account, technological feats we have accomplished. And that's how our knowledge spreads. So if paper is discovered in China one day, Within a year, it finds itself in Spain, thousands of miles away. And you thought that people are going to Hajj to fill the coffers of the, you know who. So this is how Muslims left Southwest Asia, also known as the Middle East. I don't think it's the middle of anywhere. But that's how they left the Middle East, but went to Europe because of Islam. Today, the same path, but now they are running away from Islam. That's a shame. Who's causing it? Yes, it's always easy to point to external factors. There's no denial of that. But if we didn't allow it to happen to ourselves, no one could do it to us. I was going to share some slides with you, but I thought that the topic was miserable enough that the slides would make you even more miserable. If you could imagine it in the form, it comes as follows that. Uh, from 600 to 1400, I'm talking about the common era, uh, Islam was divide, defined as a civilizational force known through its innovations, creativity, and science and technology. And Europe, Christian Europe, was defined as a regressive, reactionary, dark age place where they basically killed each other. They glorified war. The Hundred Years' War, the War of the Roses, the War of This and the War of That. And it went on and on and on. Now, from 1500s to 2000, it's the role reversal where Europe and North America are as inclusive as Muslims were. They are welcoming everyone to their fold. Look at the Nobel laureates. Where do they come from? They come from all around the world, but they live in the West. Now, compare that to what happens in the Muslim lands. The few Nobel Prizes that we have one, are simply a cry in the wilderness for peace. We haven't won anything else. In general, uh, the rise and the fall of a society depends on their adherence to their principles. And so long as a 
substantial majority of people follow that, there is no problem. But unfortunately, in the so-called Muslim lands, we are rotten to the core. Yes, there are good, wonderful people like my friends and your friends, but the rest of them, you know what I mean. We gloss over the miseries. While all faith communities have experienced such rise and fall, that the, the worst thing for, for the Muslims to be happening now is that we inflict more harm and pain to ourselves than anyone else. Whether it's Al-Qaeda or the Taliban or ISIS or whatever label you put on it, whether it's that beautiful Western-made airplane with the motto of Islam clearly on top of it, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, that goes in the month of Ramadan and it bombs innocent human beings in its neighboring country. That is our Islam in action. But what happens in the process? That those who kill say Allahu Akbar and those who are killed say Allahu Akbar. So which God is it that they are Unless we break off the shackles of this entanglement, we won't be able to claim the moral high ground to say with pride, I am a Muslim. Your claim to an Islamic identity is not your Islamicity. Your Islamicity is in your action. That is a prerequisite for your faith. So I apologize for ruining your beautiful Sunday. But I hope that if this serves as a wake-up call, that we wake up in our consciousness. We don't wake up out of a social pressure just because what people call us, that we wake up through the call that comes from the depth of our hearts so we can realize who we are. We are those in whose heart the image of the Divine is to be reflected. But it's our job to cleanse that heart, to make it shine, so it can become that mirror. Because the image of God deserves a lot better than what we have been able to deliver. Thank you. What is the name of the research that you mentioned? Um, it's Shahrazad um, Rahman, and Rahman is spelled R-E-H-M-A-N. And the other name is uh, Hussain Askari, and uh, Askari is A-S-K-A-R-I. And the title of the paper is How Islamic Are Islamic Countries? And you can Google it. Uh, and it's uh, published in the Global Econ Economy Journal. What is your message from the Indian right here to the American Muslims? Which path are we should go in order to at least begin another day, look for tomorrow? What I do don't do put a, a label on people's identity. A Muslim is a Muslim. Uh, it doesn't have to be American or Syrian or Egyptian. And in the at the philosophical level, all things, all beings are Muslim. Trees, plants, flowers, water, stones, mountains. Because we submit to the will of the Divine in the context of a harmony in nature. The harmony of nature is the Divine way. That is our God. So in that context, I think the best thing we can do is that before you point to another, we should all point to ourselves and try to make ourselves better human beings for everyone around us 
and next time you should never ask another for their faith identification. Just love them as humans, hug them as human, treat them as humans. And if we can create one human family, and we initiated and we started, uh, then perhaps others would follow. Uh, but at this point, uh, the Muslim world, unfortunately, is trying to do everything possible to make our larger collective into smaller and smaller. And these lines are drawn by national identities, political identities, linguistics, and sectarian, and so on and so forth. Uh, so if we can reverse that, but of course starting with ourselves as individuals, that would be a good positive step in the right direction, I hope.